Today, I'm going to share with you regarding the life and legacy of Biddy Mason, free woman, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and civic leader. Born August 15th, 1818, died June 16th, 1891. Bridget Biddy Mason was born into slavery in Hancock County, Georgia on August 15, 1818. She was forbidden to learn how to read or write. She developed expertise in caring for livestock, herbal medicine, nursing, and midwifery. She was bequeathed to Robert and Rebecca Smith at the age of 18. She gave birth to three daughters, Ellen, Anne, and Harriet. She walked 1,700 miles with a, behind a caravan from Mississippi to Utah in 1848. Again, she would walk 800 miles from Utah to California in 1851. The walk from Utah to California took about six months. California entered the Union as a free state September 1850, but often allowed slaveholders to retain enslaved persons as indentured servants. Biddy Mason arrived in San Bernardino, California in 1851 with her free ch three children and another enslaved woman by the name of Hannah, who had five children. Mason lived as an enslaved woman in a free state of California from 1851 to 1856. Charles and Elizabeth Wowen, free blacks, encouraged Mason to assert her freedom because California was a free state. Robert Smith attempted to leave California in 1856 with Biddy Mason and her 13 and 13 other enslaved persons. Robert Owens, Manuel Pepper, two sheriff and Vicardos prevented Smith from removing Biddy Mason, Hannah, their 11 children and Hannah's grandchild from California. The sheriff arrested all 14 enslaved women and children under the order of the courts and for their protection. Judge Benjamin Hayes of the first district in the state of California presided over the case from January 19th through the 21st of 1853. California law stated that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude unless punishment for crime shall ever be tolerated in the state. Because California law forbid, forbid it Blacks, Native Americans, Mexicans, Chinese, and other persons of mixed ancestry from testifying in court, Biddy Lason was allowed to testify in private in Judge Haynes' chamber. In January, on January 21st, 1852, 1856, Judge Hayes granted Mason her freedom papers, ruling that all men should be left to their own pursuit of freedom and happiness. Several news reports say that Judge Hayes came under great criticism for his ruling. Others believe that his ruling was incorrect because of their prejudices and biases against people of African descent. The next year, 1857, the Supreme Court ruled seven to two in the Dred Scott case that a slave was not a person, but property. Residents in a free territory did not make a slave free. Until the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery on April 8, 1864, 
Biddy Mason always carried her freedom papers and black midwife and black midwife bag. She carried these freedom papers because up until that time, bounty hunting was still very common throughout the United States when persons would come with warrant to seize individuals who were runaway slaves. There are numerous stories that in some cases they actually apprehended and arrested and took into slavery persons who actually were free. Liberty and entrepreneurship. Biddy Mason initially worked for herself as a midwife. Dr. John Griffin hired Biddy Mason to assist with his practice for $2.50 a day. Mason worked for Dr. Je Dr. Griffin at both the Los Angeles County Hospital and jail. She also continued her own practice as a midwife. IRS tax records show that in 1862, Biddy Mason paid $10 for a license as a physician. Most of her knowledge and skill were likely developed from slave doctors and midwives i.e. enslaved Africans who cared for the sick, pregnant women, and babies, who knew African, Caribbean, and American Southern herbal medicine. Mason became fluent in Spanish, but never learned to read or write. Mason earned a reputation as a skilled practitioner with exceptional skills and deep compassion. This is reiterated in numerous articles and writings about her, some being contemporary into the time that she lived. In 18, from 1856 to 1891, she delivered hundreds of babies of all socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds. She served the Mexican, Native, Chinese, Caucasian, Black, and multi ethnic families of early Los Angeles of all classes. Biddy Mason established a homestead. Biddy was one of the first African American women to own land in California. 10 years as a midwife, 10 years after 10 years as a midwife, Mason purchased a homestead. She purchased lots three and eight in block seven of the ore survey, survey on November 28th, 1866 from William Vuffham and James Barnes for $250. Mason was said to have told her children that they were to always maintain this land as a homestead. It was to remain there no matter the circumstances, they were always to retain this homestead. Historian Beasley describes Biddy Mason's homestead as the most valuable piece of property in all of beautiful California. This is a picture of the residence of Biddy Mason when she lived on first below Maine. This is a picture of Biddy Mason's residence when she was residing at 31, I'm sorry, at 331 Spring Street. Generosity and philanthropy. During the smallpox epidemic, Biddy Mason risked her life to care for others and distinguish herself as a woman of great courage and empathy. During the floods in 1884, she gave an open order at the Spring Street gro grocery store. By the terms of this order, all families made homeless by the flood were supplied with groceries while Biddy Mason paid the bill. She visited and cared for prisoners throughout the remainder of her life. She provided them food. She visited prisoners, giving them hope and nourishment. Her home at number 331 Spring Street, in later years became a refuge for stranded and needy settlers. There are even some reports that she took in children 
who have been abandoned. Affluence and influence. In addition to her homestead, Biddy Mason purchased for $375 four lots in the block boundary of Olive and Charity Street. In 1850, Mason made her grandson the chance to, and her, gave her, offered her grandsons the chance to establish a lavery stable on her property. And in 1888, the venture having provided success, she deeded to them for $10. Her grandson, Robert Owens, had a successful career in politics. Several articles recognized him during the time of his life as the most affluent African-American man living in Los Angeles. It is believed that she employed her family and other African-Americans and people of color. It is also believed that she helped build the first school and provided a daycare for women who needed to work. It is also believed that she financed up to 11 conv convalescent home for those who were aging. Biddy Mason also helped found First African Methodist Episcopal Church in Los Angeles in 1872. This church is now renowned under the name of fame. In its early inception, Biddy Mason provided a location in her home for the early meetings. She also provided $500 for the early building of the church. In subsequent years, she would continue to pay the taxes and support the ministerial staff. This is Biddy Mason's lavery on third and spring. As I said before, the early services of First AME Church were initially held in her property at her home, and she donated $500 to start the church. It is also believed that she granted the land on Azusa and San Pedro for the original location of the church in 1872. And as stated before, she paid their taxes expenses and ministerial staff for several years. Biddy Mason had a life model. It was very simple. If you hold your hand closed, nothing good can come in. The open hand is blessed for it gives in abundance even as it receives. Biddy Mason's estate. The estate consisted of Spring Street thir and Third and Fourth Street, running back to Broadway and adjoining to the Spring Street lot. The properties were known as number 331, 333, and 835. Later, this area would be known as the Owens Block named after her grandson. Miss Ellen Huddleton, uh, Huddle, Huddleton, the daughter of Biddy Mason and the mother of Charles Owen, continued to accumulate re real estate. It is believed that she too made wise investments. Several contemporary articles written about her at, a at the time of her life said that she bought 10th Street flat at a value of $20,000 and the homestead uh, that she had was valued at $45,000. She also retained controlling interest in Mason's estate, making improvements and increasing its value. Robert O. Owens, one of Biddy Mason's grandsons, became the richest African-American in Los Angeles. He was known for contributions to Tuskegee University and for his friendship with Booker T. Washington. Although he was not successful, he set out to create a similar institute 
referring to it as the Biddy Mason Institute during the planning stage. He believed that this would be a place committed to the betterment of African-American youth and that its bottom floor would be a memorial to Biddy Mason. Property that he purchased on Hill and 8th for $65,000 increased in value to over $300,000. Our inheritance. I have been driven to study the life of Biddy Mason because of our commitment to establish a house of prayer on the foot street, footprint of the former Azusa Street Mission, which was also the original location of First AME Church, now known as Fame. It is this church in 1872 that Biddy Mason helped to found. I believe that this is a picture of how believers coming out of great persecution could use their skills to earn a living, but not only earn a living, but establish a foothold and a footprint in a city. And once establishing that footprint in a city, a homestead, other properties and businesses, they too could become givers. And this is what we see in the life of Biddy Mason. Biddy Mason was renowned for giving to the poor. It is said up to the latter years of her life, she continued to be a place of refuge for those who were stranded in Los Angeles. It is also said in numerous stories that up until the time that she died, that people would often come to her home and seek assistance. There are stories that say her grandchildren had to turn people away at the gate because even when she became very frail, people still sought help from her. But we also know that Biddy Mason was renowned for visiting prisons and taking care of prisoners. And this is something that we too are called to do as believers, is to take care of those who are in prison. We also know that Biddy Mason was believed to have taken care of orphans. It was said that her home, had that she had provided an orphanage for children who had been abandoned. We also know that the Bible admonishes us or commands us to take care of the orphans. It is also believed that she built convalescent homes for those who were in their elder years. It's like we know that the Bible tells us to care for the widow. I suspect that many of those who she served were actually widowers, widows. The other thing that we learn from Biddy Mason's life is that we are called to be generous. We are called to give of our means so that others might have. We know in the early stories of Acts that the church was known to have sold their possessions and had all things in common so that there was no lack among them. I believe that our generation is being called to be benevolent, to be generous, to be those who Jesus spoke to of, who said, Lord, when did we help you? And he said, well, you visited me when I was a prison and you fed me when I'm hungry. And I believe we're called to do the same in this hour and in this day. That we are called to be a people who feed the hungry and care for those who are in prison. So let us too begin to build a place where it is noted for its generosity, where it's noted for being a place where the people of God, out of the fruit that God has given to them, bless others and make provision for others. Biddy Mason's land holdings are estimated to have been worth $300,000 at her death, likely $8.3 million today. By diligence, exceptional skill, a good reputation, saving, wise investment, generosity, and deep compassion, Biddy Mason climbed out of bondage 
into affluence and influence, leaving an inheritance for her children's children and a legacy for all Los Angelinos and Americans. Let her life be a witness to us, a witness of the gospel. Let her life be a witness to us of what Christ called us to do, which is to love one another. Let her life be a witness to us to be the good Samaritan, the one who sees the person lying in the street, picks them up, takes them to the end, and provides for their care. Let this be the mark of our ministry. Let this be the mark of our lives. Let this be our, the mark of our place in the marketplace and in the government and in the church and in our families. Let us too rise to this place of generosity to be a reflection of Christ in all that we do. Let her life be a witness to us that out of great hardship can spring forth a living well called freedom, liberty, and generosity. Let us all come to this well and drink, and let us become those who give others a drink who are thirsty. This here is a picture of the Memorial Park, now get it, dedicated to Biddy Mason at 333 Spring Street in Los Angeles. California 90013. I believe this is a great place to visit and to spend time with your family and to look at the legacy of Biddy Mason. On this 50, 50 foot long wall, you'll walk through a chronology of the journey of Biddy Mason from slavery to a woman who became an entrepreneur to a person who became a landholder and was seen as a person of great generosity in our church and in her community. These are other resources that you can look at on the life of Biddy Mason. I'll take any questions that you might have. 